188 years ago, in March of 1836, the non-American Texans, who were mostly Americans anyway, fought a fateful battle known as the Battle of the Alamo. Most of you are familiar with the story of the Alamo. Something like 60 defenders held off thousands of troops, and the colonel in charge of the garrison there said, victory or death, and they were all killed. And it ended up turning the tide, not of that particular battle, but of the war, because Texans rallied to that cause. In the same way, we've heard people like Vivek Ramaswamy talk about how the United States is at a 1776 moment. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I have this Betsy Ross flag on the wall. It's the reason why I have some of these historic weapons on the wall. But we're doing a modern take on that right now. We're experiencing the modern version of it. We're looking at this, this stand that we have to take in this country about our values. And we're saying victory or death. It feels existential because this is not just a battle for politics. This is a cultural battle and it's a spiritual battle. And many of us have that sense as well. We're battling for the values of what it is to be American. And some of these things which have been long held in this country for well over 200 years, are starting to be debated in ways that we can't even fathom. Let's talk about the Texas border, the New Mexico border, the California border, the Arizona border, this entire Southern border. It only touches a few states. I just named them for you. It's not that many. And yet the people that are coming across there are able to fundamentally change the nature of this country because they're not just changing who's in this country. They're changing what the values look like, not just from the Southern end, but also from the politicians who are making those arguments. Let's just talk about numbers. We expect roughly 2 million gotaways. What's a gotaway? That's somebody that wasn't even encountered by our law enforcement apparatus. We have people that are sworn to protect and do a duty down there to secure the American country. And they're not allowed to do it. And that's coming from not a change in laws, not because Congress has gone out there and hamstring them. We've moved the needle and we've moved what is acceptable to do. And now what are they doing? They're, they're claiming that this is not the fault of the administration. This is actually on Congress. It's on the previous administration. That's false. There've been no changes in the federal laws. There's only been change in a federal will to do the right thing. And that got turned over in 2021 when Joe Biden took office. Our federal government lost 85,000 or more children. They're, the new results are coming in closer to 100,000 kids who were in our charge, who came over without parents, and then were just resettled into the United States and poof, they're gone. We don't know where they are. They can be trafficked for labor, for sex. The horrific nature of this is almost too much to, to handle. It's like hearing that 6 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. We can't even fathom that. Imagine every single person at your work every single person in your church. That's the kind of numbers that are, that are tangible to us. And that's a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket. That's a fraction of 100,000 children that are living in some sort of slave-like conditions that may be trafficked around, but are certainly brought in by people who didn't even know them. Many of them were unrelated. That's because the cartels are running our border right now and not our own government. Not because we're not able, by the way, but because we're unwilling. There's a failure of will and so we got to ask some questions about why that is. But what are the results of this? It's pretty obvious. People are incentivized to come through this porous border. They're being moved up through the Darien Gap. They're coming all the way up Central America and through Mexico. These are not Mexican people that are looking for you know, a chance to work here. These are people that are coming in from the Middle East, from Africa, from Asia. There's a mass number of Chinese that are coming in. It's not the most convenient way to get here, but it's the most effective way because we are not policing our own border. We've just given it up. And that comes down to political will. It's not the will of the border patrol, by the way, and it's not the will of those who work in DHS, generally speaking. It's political superiors that are coming in and saying, don't do your job or you're gonna lose it, which puts them in a crisis. Paycheck versus duty. It's incredibly difficult to, to deal with this. I've navigated this myself. I used to work for the FBI and I was in the same position. Most people, don't understand how their little piece of the pie is going to affect the larger thing. But let's talk about it. There's all this human catastrophe left and right. There must be some purpose, right? Is it misguided compassion? I think that actually exists for those who are at the bottom of the political left, those who are sort of motivated to support those policies. There's obviously money involved and a lot of it. This is a multi-billion dollar trafficking possibility between drugs and guns and people. There's an incredible amount of money at stake. We're looking at a destabilization of our country, and is it just simply because of the oldest thing in the world, greed and power? Here's where I think the compassion argument fails. 
people who are brought to this country that get sold into slavery are not any better off than they were in any other country they were living in. People come here because they have a sense of hope about what the American dream is, about that spirit, that fighting spirit, like they had in the Alamo. They come here because they think that they, through sheer force of will, can generate a better life. But our administration is pushing something different, and it's getting a very different class of people coming in. What they're telling them is, come on in, and we'll just take care of you, because we owe it to you. It's a feeling of guilt, this American excess, that we have all this comfort, and who are we to keep it? Meanwhile, we're ignoring our veterans. We're ignoring our poor, which we have many. We have a lot of people that are not perfectly well-suited, and yet we're bringing in more, people at the bottom. And that only hurts people who are working at a low wage, the working class, the working poor. Those are the ones who are most affected. So the concept that this is about compassion, it's misguided. And even those who honestly believe that, we can easily talk them out of it. If you promise somebody one thing and you bring them to a completely different situation, who's the bad guy, them or you? Imagine making a uh, promise to your kids. Hey, we're going to take you to this place. We're going to show you Disneyland. And then you take them to a strip of dirt somewhere and it just says Disneyland on a sign, but there's no rides. They've been conned. They've been deceived. They're going to be upset with you. And those people who are upset in this case are angry and they're poor and they have nothing. They've come to this country expecting something that was promised to them that's not going to be delivered. It's dangerous for them. It's dangerous for those around them. That end goal may be chaos. And we have to consider that. One of the things the political left has used for a long time, people talk about stuff like the uh, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. The other one we hear about a lot is a thing called the Cloward-Piven effect. And Cloward and Piven were two professors that were looking into a way to seize power in the 1960s. And what they came up with was, if you can destabilize a local situation, if you could overwhelm the resources that are able to be handled at the local level, that means there's too much crime for your local cops and you can't field enough cops to handle it. You might have to ask for the next level up of resources, state level, federal level. The Cloward Piven strategy is simply to overwhelm local systems until the point where they beg for help and they beg for more government. Now, the left solutions to all things is always government. It's always more money and more government. It's an unfalsifiable premise. And we hear it a lot, too. If you had just given us these, these laws, we could do more. If you could just give us more funding, then we could solve this problem. There's this concept known as the illusory truth effect. It's when something is repeated enough times that we actually digest it and we believe that it's true. When you start hearing that the only answer is, we just need more government, then you start hearing people in good faith arguing that that more government is the answer. We have a war against poverty, a war against drugs. None of these things are solved. The government's actually usually the worst answer, even when it's the only answer. So you start thinking, why do I care? Why should I care? I'm just one guy. Because each of your neighbors has a vote. And every single person that you touch, touches more people. A lot of those people are living with a concept that we call cognitive dissonance. If we were able to be honest with it, they would be walking around with a migraine. It's their ideas running into their other ideas at full speed. And it causes your brain to hurt. You start thinking, uh, the cops are corrupt and we can't trust them. And then you also think, uh, nobody should own guns except the cops. And those ideas are in conflict at all times. It's the same thing as saying, we need to bring in people. America has so much wealth, we need to share it. And then you bring them in and say, now we're going to put them and make them sleep on the streets or sleep at O'Hare Airport on the ground. They're in no better situation. This should be causing cognitive dissonance. You can help your neighbors with this. You can help them understand that their ideas, they're not bad people. They're just failing to understand the situation. I think it often comes down to first order thinking, which is to say we need to be kind. And that knee jerk instinct can often lead to things that are unkind outcomes. That's where we have to try to distract ourselves. That's the reason why you engage with your neighbors. That's the reason why you should care. Because in this country, if we want it to survive, we not only have to fight for values, we also have to fight for every individual vote. We have to move the needle in our own communities, locally. And what you'll find is, is that as we start reaching out, there's a lot of your neighbors that think the same way you do, regularly. Regular people think like regular people they always have. That hasn't changed. But what we've had is this megaphone pushing out false information in a way that allowed us to think that we were by ourselves, that we were unique in the world and nobody else thought like us. We better keep our mouth shut. Internalized censorship. This this problem is, is often kind of confronted from the Christian side of saying, well, aren't we supposed to love our neighbor? Aren't we supposed to, to give to those who need? Of course. But I want you to think of a very simple analogy. Flying on an airplane, 
that safety speech that you want to just disregard every single time you hear it because you've heard it a million times. What do they always tell you? They tell you if the cabin loses pressure. By the way, we've lost pressure in this country, have we not? We have a porous border. That's what a, that's what a pressure loss looks like. You have to solidify your own safety first. How do you do that? In the airplane, you put on your own mask. That means that you shore up your community, your family, your life, your finances, your spirituality. You put those all and get them solid before you can help your neighbor. And then you have to help your neighbor. If you don't have a solid ground to stand on, how are you going to pull them in? You can't pull somebody into the boat when you're not in the boat yourself. You're just going to drown with them. It's the first thing they teach you when you're a lifeguard, by the way. This country has the same problem on a much bigger scale. And the reason we all have to be engaged is because, one, we all have a say in this. Two, we have to demand it from our politicians. And three, we have a role that we have to play, a very specific action set. And those actions are shore up our own lives, shore up our neighbors as best we can, and then speak the truth because the truth is the same. It's always been the same. And if, if you get right down to it, our, our neighbors and our friends and our loved ones that are on the political left that don't want to speak to us because the last couple of years have been very contentious, they actually all sort of know the right answer too because most of them grew up and lived in it for the entirety of their lives minus the last five or six years. This is not a foreign concept. That's why we're in the Alamo right now. The Alamo was a bunch of regular people. It was a bunch of regular men that made a very difficult decision to say, this is the last stand. There's nowhere to retreat. The enemy is on all sides. And we're going to fight this battle as it needs to be fought, even if it means losing it, because the war is the most important part, the larger concept. You may lose arguments. You may lose some friends. But you might also plant that idea in their head that helps them understand that their thinking is not helping them. It's actually them looking to drown. It's looking to get grabbed by that drowning person. We cannot drown ourselves and save anybody. So we have to start looking out for what makes the most sense. And so rather than have this misplaced, mistaken kindness for weakness situation that we have in our current southern border, what we ought to be looking at is what is the best outcome for the people that are coming here? And are they going to get what we are promising them? If we truly care about what the outcome will be for these folks, then the answer is to shut down the demand side, cheap labor and, and more people and this political will. None of that is charitable. It's not loving your neighbor. It's offering false hope. It's offering disappointment. None of those things result in a positive outcome. We remember the Alamo for the reason that it was important, because it was a final stand where people decided victory or death. Be good to your neighbors, y'all. We'll see you soon.